Hello and welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Chat with Robert Deed and myself, John Der Perez. And this will be Robert a multi-part, right? as we were discussing before we doesn't started filming this. It doesn't have to be. We'll see where it goes. But anyway, we we received a comment from uh, one of our viewers, and uh, pretty much dissecting what the costs are of investing in Toronto real estate, carrying it, property tax, insurance. A headache tenants. I'm trying to be polite as much as possible. And is it worth it in the midst of a rising interest rate environment? Prices are going down uh, into the indefinite, who knows when. Meanwhile, uh, Robert, who's been a practitioner for many, many decades, um, myself, I've been licensed for about 20 ish years, and I haven't seen some of the markets Robert has seen. But when we look back at statistically speaking, the average price of Toronto real estate and real estate in general. Toronto, I can comment on, we have about a 7% on average appreciation rate, but is that something that will be sustained? Uh, we've seen 20, 30, 40, well, I don't know, 40 is probably pushing it, but double digit price growth in the last um, couple of time periods because of pandemic pushing supply low, cheap money, as we've talked about Robert and I in the past episodes. And so the question becomes, is it worth it? Is it worth buying Toronto real estate. Now, we weren't going to record this episode. I mean, as much as you guys probably like reality television, we weren't going to record it. We were just conversing. You know, Robert, what kind of factors or numbers or variables do we need to consider to come up with an actual conclusion to is it worth it? But as we got deeper into the discussion, we realized, you know what, it's worth putting this on camera because we started talking about different areas in the city. Um, and no matter where you are in the world, if you're watching this worldwide, uh, like according to our stats, about 50% of us watching this are in Canada. So the, the rest of the 50% are somewhere else. Real estate is moving right now, I guess, uh, in, in similar fashion, unless you're in a place where it's ultra high inflation right now. But let's talk about Toronto specifically. We started talking about the different types of investors, the different locations you can invest, the different property types, how much work you have to put in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Robert and I, let's we're going to resume this conversation. Uh, and Robert, the last points I want you to reiterate as much as possible from what you've said, you identified several kinds of people looking to invest in real estate, right? So what were those kinds of people like in terms of involvement, in terms of expectations, in terms of qualifications? Let's start there. Okay. Um, you've got professional investors that know what they're looking for, know what the numbers are, they have an accountant, they have a property manager, they have uh, a, a list of uh, uh, reliable servicemen they can call on if anything happens. You got someone who's buying his very first investment property, be it a house or be it a condo, because he just got burned by the stock market. And he says, I don't understand how that darn thing works, but what I do understand is one tenant, one property, one mortgage, money in and out. I've now got this lump of dough and I'm going to work out my math and I'm going to plunk down this dough and I'm going to get myself a tenant and I'm going to wait for 15 years. And at the end of the 15 years, I'll decide whether I want to refinance it or I want to, what I want to do. So there's a, a mom and pop, but not unrealistic expectations. You've got a 15 year horizon. Now you've got somebody else who is watching the market and says, wow, everything's going up, 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 up. How can I get in? And so he buys anything that with his down payment, he can get a mortgage broker or the Toronto Dominion Bank or somebody to give him a loan and he can put them enough cash down to close the deal and he can get a tenant and then he can see how it goes. After a year, it's gone up in value. Up at, after two years, it's gone up in value again. The tenant gives him a little bit of a hassle. And so he says, you know, maybe this is the time to sell. And then he looks at the appreciation and says, no, nah, I got to wait a little bit longer. And then you got somebody else who says, oh, I don't want all the problems with tenants. I don't want all the problems with uh, servicing the mortgage and paying this and paying that. This pre-construction condo, this hmm. seems to be a good deal because I can control 100% of the asset with 20% cash outlay. Now, I don't make anything on the 20%, but I don't pay anything for principal interest, taxes, maintenance, worry, tenant operation, none of that stuff for three, four, five, seven years. And I get the appreciation during that whole time. And the only downside to that is you're buying at a future price. But all those things about, you know, time, no cost, they're all valid as long as the market keeps on going up. 
you know, if you're looking seven years ahead the way it did the seven years in the past. So also in the middle of that with the condo pre-cons, which a lot of people have bought condo pre-construction, is the federal government, Revenue Canada, decided that they were going to get very, very specifically targeted at these type of investors that bought it and then did what we call an assignment of interest. It's a flip. It's an assignment of interest before actually taking ever possession to somebody else who might take possession. And these fellas in the early time of it, I'm saying fellas because these people aimed to be invisible. They were going to buy it from the builder. So they would be purchaser A and they would find purchaser B. And when the time came, they would assign their interest of A to B. And then the builder would do the, uh, the initial registration and closing to B and B A would just take his profit and not show up anywhere. No income tax, no HST, no nothing, no nothing, no nothing. It was fantastic. And they got away with it for about five, 10 years. And then all of a sudden, Revenue Canada said, ooh, this is easy money. We can get these guys because all we have to do is put two little pieces of document together and get them. So the type of investor determines the type of property, determines really what's going to happen. You've got boring, uh, patient, uh, ridiculous, and foolish. And so is it worth it? Well, it's never worth to be foolish. Is it worth it? If you know everything that you're going to run into, then it's a matter of selecting the right property that will give you the end result based on some reasonable probability of the past seven years being equal to the next or maybe being half as good or being flat or you know, do you, what's your time horizon? So in the old days, everything was about gotta carry. As long as the tenant's gonna pay enough to carry your principal and interest and taxes, like you're winning. You don't consider just consider, concern yourself with income tax ramifications, never mind capital gain, never mind re retirement or gain of equity by retirement of the principal sum from the amortization, you like you are paying it down. And then you got market appreciation. That if you're real sophisticated, you have these all calculated out with the internal rate of return. And you can make a prediction on this type of a property, what it's going to be in 10 years and what you're going to expect as a return in the meantime. But there's, there's a few assumptions you got to make, and sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. So you try and underestimate. So the question is perhaps simpler than what I just said, but if you are a consumer who's saying, is it worth it? Saying, well, if you buy anything that has guaranteed upside because of the rate of change of growth of the property, you're getting changes of zoning, which permit things that couldn't happen 10 years ago now, you'll get slammed up. Buy in the path of change. I went to a conference in 1982. It was the World uh, Real Estate Conference, FIABC. That's the acronym for the French name. And Toronto was the host, and we were the um, host real estate board, so we were the Sergeant Arms Committee. And... Uh, what to some of the seminars because we can go anyway. This is what the guy says, buy in the path of change, buy two years ahead of redevelopment. So you buy raw land thinking that in two years, it's gonna be now ready for rezoning. And so it'll go from being a pasture to being a industrial unit, to being a, a golf course, to being a future site for a new subdivision. So that's a long answer that maybe we didn't get to the question. Yet. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a good thorough answer. And the me being, I like to crunch numbers and see what that looks like in numbers, and that'll be saved for a future episode. The thinking behind this is it's become accepted, and correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, but it's become accepted that investors in Toronto real estate don't invest for cash flow because you'd have to put a significant, I mean, I guess, you know, we can look back at, well, yeah, it depends on what kind of investor, but let's forget about that for now. Yeah. An investor in Toronto doesn't look at cash flow, they look at appreciation. Proof of that is, look, most properties right now, if you calculated it with the typical 20, let's say even 25%, even 30% down will not produce or barely any of them. You'll be looking at them. Exactly. But, and so you're looking at, let's just, for the sake of easy numbers, let's say you're down 200, 300, 500 a month, 6,000 yep. a year, right? The thinking is, as long as my property goes up by at least 6,000, which is more than likely in an up market, then it doesn't matter. If my property went up by 10,000, that's okay for me spending 6,000 of my own money, 
putting it into the cash flow and carrying it because my 500 a month, 6,000 a year to gain 10,000, I'm positive $4,000. Now that might be the, you know, the entry level or, 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 you know, beginner type investors. You sent me an article a while back of how, I don't know if it was a fund of some sort or in, like a conglomerate, but, or a, you know, a syndicate or a group that were buying properties. And there's lots of these. Some Canadian companies are buying US properties. Real estate US investment trusts is what they exactly. do. Exactly. So they're buying houses and now they're not buying uh, properties right now yes. within this marketplace. So I guess for an investor and to continue with the theme, is it, theme, is it worth it? Today I'm buying, let's say, and, and we'll crunch the numbers next episode, but I'm buying a property. Let's say it's a bungalow. Let's say it has a basement apartment. So, and let's presume it's a legal basement. Now I've got two, an upper unit, lower unit. Let's say 2000 is my upper, 1000 is my lower. So that's $3,000 of rent, maybe more. But what is that $1 million condo, uh, it's not a condo, $1 million, some condos are million, $1 million bungalow, two units, what is that costing me to carry right now? So you, right. you've got to put 20% uh, down, so it's a million dollars, $800,000 mortgage. Now, at our old days price of less than 2% uh, interest, so if you say $3 per thousand, right? It's 20, yeah. Times that's 800, yep. that's 2,400. So you're 3,000 plus taxes, plus maintenance. You're going to repair the stove. And, um, you're probably breaking even with $20,000 down, yes. CITM. And uh, you've just got two units. You can manage that. The guy phones you at 11 o'clock. Maybe you hire a property manager. Maybe you just do it yourself. Again, if your objective is to wait until that building, bungalow basement apartment, becomes a site for a mansion house that can be redeveloped on it. Someone's going to pay you far more for the law if it's permissible than they would for any other use. It's fine. Or if it's just to, uh, you're going to spend a thousand dollars on it every now and again and fix it up and replace the kitchen just before you sell it. And who knows what you're going to do. And, and you're, or, But again, you can't do it in one year. You've got to have a plan for five, maybe longer a period of time. If you have just one property, like that works. So that's why when interest rates move to not being $3 per thousand, but being $6 per thousand, it blows all those numbers out because the, the, the rent up and rent down didn't change that much. And uh, your costs double. Your well, interest even, if, even if rents did change. So I'm looking at the rental report and for well, example, they didn't, they didn't exactly. Like you're talking about 15% at the most, 20% as a one bedroom, but those are condos. But uh, when you're looking at larger places, they didn't double. So it would be fair to say that during the times that 2% was the rate, this $1 million today bungalow was one point, well, we were just doing this earlier, 1.2 almost, right? And so even then, crunching those numbers would have been a bit tough. And so somebody looking to invest today, if this is your first investment property, you've got to basically ask yourself, is it okay for me to spend 500, maybe up to $1,000 of my own pocket money to float this and to keep it. Now, you're looking at a long-term game here, like 15, 20, 25 years. Robert, it'd be fair to say that this $1 million, and you know what, 20 years from now, 10 years from now, five years, whenever we watch this video again, it'll be interesting to see this $1 million Scarborough, Bendale, Bungalow would be worth you know, 7% compounding on a yearly basis, 10, 15 years probably what, double by then? Could we be seeing that at $2 million by then such that somebody who invested today and was okay with spending 500, 1,000 out of their own pocket would 10, 15, 20 years be sitting on something that has now doubled? Because historically it has. Like, no matter no what you buy, it. no matter what you buy in 20 years is smart. No matter what. And particularly, it's always that way if you're living it. If you're living in it, now it's furnished you with that use. You've got to live somewhere. If it's strictly something, it's an investment, it's aside from where you live, then it's got to do different things. Would you be better off buying T-bills? Would you be better off, if you knew what you were doing, buying bonds? Would you be better off buying GICs or something equally boring? Or like compared to what? That someone 
who is like one of the reasons why our sales are off by 40% from a normal 10 year average is because there's no specs. No specs are buying. They're saying, well, oh, I think rate prices are going down. Why should I buy for market appreciation when I think they're going to go down? It's not. So they're not. They're dumping mm -hmm. because they think I'm tapped out. I'll take what gain I've got and I'll just liquidate. And then I'll sit with cash, wait till cash is king again and uh, buy just before the market takes off again. Because again, the junior spec thinks he's smarter than everybody else. And guess what? He's not because nobody's stupid. And so nobody, you know, you might find one uh, state sale by some lawyer that's from Kingston and doesn't know the market locally, just lets it go. You know, there's always a one-up situation that um, uh, breaks the rule. But if someone had to ask a yes or no answer to, is this the time to buy a uh, investment property for someone who doesn't know what they're doing? The answer is no. Was five years ago the time for someone who doesn't want to know what they're doing? No, but it could have worked out. And yeah. so was that from good planning or dumb luck? And let's say when it is dumb luck. Oh, yeah. I mean, nobody would have predicted the pandemic to happen. Nobody would have predicted double digit price growth. And if you're looking at historically 7% uh, year over year returns, you could invest in the S&P or the TSX and whatever, and you'd see similar returns, except it's not leveraged. And that's another um, I guess decision making or argument you can you can say versus real estate versus stock markets versus bonds whatever is the leveraging of it. So one famous uh, way of positioning real estate investment is yeah sure you can put a hundred thousand dollars in the TSX or the S and P, or you can put a hundred thousand in leveraged real estate which gets you you know five hundred thousand or two hundred thousand but gets you a million, but your returns are leveraged your your, your returns are. Um, exponential because it's based on leveraged amounts of money and somebody paying down your mortgage. So I guess, how do we wrap up a discussion like this? I mean, the question is, is it worth it? And the answer is in 20 years, yes. Right now, if you don't know what you're doing, no. But you've got to look at you individually, whoever's watching this, you've got to crunch these numbers thoroughly and make sure that you can afford to get into the market if now's the time. I mean, there's still factors that are out of our control that could point to a downward moving price, uh, average price mar in the market. And that's something you don't want to necessarily be caught in if you cannot afford. And if you're relying on your income to pay for the cash flow negative and, you know, something happens to said, said income, then you've got to look at that factor as well, right? Especially if this is the first time you invest. Robert, any other points you want to bring up here? Well, our boring underwriting at the major banks, if you can't do it, they won't lend it to you. So if you can get a mortgage at prime rates, then you're probably going to be okay because they're taking the risk along with you. If you have to go to the secondary or private market and pay 15% for 10% of it and 12% for 10% of it and whatever it is you need to go to close the deal because you can only get a 70% first from a private guy who wants 9%, then you know what? That's going to fail. Mm -hmm. Because we don't, we can't promise you an appreciating market of 20% a year. Like we said, I forget what it was, 27 or 29 months in a row where we had double digit annual increases for almost two years and then it happened before the crunch fell down for 22 17 2015 to 217 we had it for another 24 months there double digit increases completely unsustainable unless there's a recovery from some terrible thing before but there wasn't this is just a speculative boom right so um is there another conclusion no there's not another conclusion fair enough well, if you have any questions about this particular episode, and uh, you know what, we're, we're going to review this. We're going to look at various investment options. We're going to look at pre uh, We have to know who the client is and what yeah. his objectives are to make yeah. give an answer. So we'll have to hypothesize have to, three, yeah, different, have, three different exactly, scenarios. Exactly. We're going to have to look at different scenarios, and we'll do that in future episodes. And pre-con is another one, right? So, I mean, for, for the sake of today's episode, we're not going to talk about it here. But the interesting question there is, you know, if you buy pre-con today, are you presuming that in the future, when it's built three, five, seven years from now, five, seven years from now, that the market's going to be better and you'll actually get that price on the market more or more 
and hopefully not less. But that's another question for another time. And will the builder exercise their economic viability clause in the meantime? That's a big question. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Real Estate Chat. We'll see you next time. Indeed. Bye for now. Bye-bye.